Good morning. My name is Michael Daly. I'm excited to be here with you today to, to share God's Word. If you're a first-time guest, we have been in the book of First Timothy, and we're wrapping up with a few more sermons uh, in this book, um, or this epistle, if you will. And one of the things that we have learned throughout this letter to Timothy from Paul is that Paul is urging and commanding Timothy to guard the deposit of the gospel by remaining true with a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. These principles and these, this main idea that we have learned throughout these past few months echoed in the, in the streets of uh, Ephesus as well as the church of Ephesus, and they still ring true for us today here at Brookwood. We are not called to guard the gospel because it is, it is weak or frail or brittle. We are called to guard it because it is the only true source of life. Last week, we focused on how we're called to live out the gospel as bond servants and masters or slaves and bosses. And this week, we're going to see Paul shift his focus back to the false teachers that were in Ephesus in, pre- in, in their preaching. With that in mind, let me submit to you today's main idea, and then we'll read the text together. Well, I will read it. You will, you will listen. Be cautious. True godliness does not crave wealth. Instead, it finds its contentment in Christ and shares what God has given. 1 Timothy 6, starting in 2b, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and a constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now jump down to verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor they set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Teaching correct doctrine and urging the people of God to follow Christ and live out godliness has been very, very important for Paul throughout this letter, as well as the New Testament. Remember, Paul's charge to Timothy is to guard the gospel against false teachers. And as he's reminded Timothy, the church cannot guard if the church does not know the truth. You may think there are no false teachers in Ephesus based on what we just read in, in verse, verse 3 that says, if anyone teaches. But we know from the opening chapter of this letter, as well as the book of Acts, that Paul has commanded Timothy to stay in Ephesus and charged him to preach uh, and to command certain people not to teach false doctrine. These teachings were false, and they contradicted what Paul and the other apostles, and most importantly, what Christ taught. They did not agree with the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And since that was the case, it was not the true gospel. Because the true gospel, as we have learned, must align with what Christ taught, with what he preached. It must promote 
Godliness. Godliness is the posture of a person's heart that is, that is submissive to God, desires to be more like Christ, and most importantly, is obedient to, uh, to carrying out the commands in their life and applying it to their lives. Paul really could have posed a rhetorical question and said, you say you love Christ, are you keeping his commandments? The answer to that question reveals to the false teachers that they were not, in fact, keeping the commandments of Christ, and they were not practicing godliness. Instead, the teaching, instead, the false gospel circulating in the church of Ephesus did not exemplify godly behavior and was not in line with what Christ taught. The false teachers promoting their doctrine thought they were wise in their understanding. They appeared to possess some different knowledge needed to promote godly living. However, as Paul explains in verse 4, the people teaching a false gospel are puffed up with conceit and actually understand nothing of the true gospel. Since Ephesus was a melting pot of many different secular beliefs, it makes sense why Paul is commanding Timothy and urging Timothy to guard the gospel. All these other ideas of godliness have been making their way around Ephesus for a while now, and some of Timothy's church was probably saved from this falseness. At the end of verse 5, we get a better idea of the belief system circulating the hearts and minds of these false teachers. They thought godliness was a means of financial gain. The theme of greed circulated through the streets of Ephesus, which ultimately found its roots in Roman culture. Financial gain and achieving a wealthy status within this society was very, very prominent, and it started with the governing officials. In fact, if you notice, the teachings that they were selling, promoting, did not promote unity whatsoever within the body of Christ. It was the exact opposite. Notice how the results of the the teaching disrupts relationships within the body. It produces controversy, fighting, evil dissension, slander, and evil suspicion. When the foolish sell their unhealthy doctrine, this is the byproduct that we'll have when we start to believe it. It is wickedness. It is evil. In contrast, the teachers, the preachers, the Christians who have a a genuine and a real relationship with Christ, empowered by the Spirit, They will guard the gospel and their relationship with Christ because they understand that's the most important thing. The character uh, will be that of humility, coupled with a servant spirit. And as they seek the Lord through their relationship with Christ, they will model for the congregation that true godliness only wants to gain more of Christ and less money. But our culture seems to be selling something different, does it not? Many people think that by putting your faith in Christ, that should equal financial blessing. Or by believing in God, you should have all the health and success and and power, so to speak. This is a lie. It's known as the prosperity gospel. These teachers of this gospel are no different than those that Paul is talking about here. Our success is not measured by our godliness. It's not measured by how many times we've been promoted. It's not measured if we own the company. We are not more godly if we have gained more wealth in life. And the opposite is also true. We are not less godly if we are wealthy. Remember Abraham, Solomon, and characters in the Old Testament, they, they were wealthy, but they weren't, they weren't godly because of their wealth. They were righteous in the eyes of God because of their faith in Christ. It was through their faith that they were counter righteous. Paul then transitions down to verses 6 through 8, and he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we are brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But with food and clothing, with these we will be content. In Paul's mind, godliness is being satisfied with what God has already provided. It acknowledges that everything that we have belongs to God, 
and we will trust God will provide what we need. Any Christian or, or non-Christian recognizes the common sense behind this uh, example that Paul lays out. We know that we cannot bring anything into, the, into this world when we're born, and we know when we leave, we're not taking anything with us. This is a common sense illustration that Paul's Jewish audience probably, when they heard this, they probably recognized Job. If you remember the character of Job in the Old Testament after God allowed Satan to destroy him and destroy his, his family and take his possessions and, and whatnot. Job's response was, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised forever. But for Paul, Paul has learned through experiences and through trials and how to be content in all situations. And now he reminds Timothy and urges Timothy in the church of Ephesus that true godliness is not about seeking and storing up wealth. It's about seeking God and being content with what he has provided. Jesus tells of a parable about storing up treasures in heaven versus storing up, or storing up treasures in heaven versus storing away earthly possessions in Luke chapter 12. In this parable, a rich man possess, uh, produces many crops from his land. He produces so many crops that he has to actually build bigger barns to store them. Seems logical, right? So he builds these barns, he stores them in there. And he recognizes that, man, I have so much in my barns, I don't need to work anymore. I can live off what these crops will produce for the rest of my life. So he eats, drinks, takes off work, does nothing more to contribute to society. He is living a good life, so he thinks. But God then says to him, fool, what if you die tonight? Who will receive the things that you have stored up? The point of the parable that Jesus is trying to make is not to ensure we have an up-to-date will. Jesus' point is, do not make it your life's purpose to seek, desire, and store up riches for yourself here on earth, because they serve no purpose for you in eternity. Not only can't you take these possessions with you when you pass into eternity, but these possessions will not satisfy your soul. Instead, make it your life's purpose to be rich in your relationship with God. When we seek godliness through practicing the spirit of disciplines, we will learn to be content with what God has provided. This is how godliness with contentment is great gain. I like how one commentator said, the human soul was not created to find contentment in the accumulation of stuff. This is a phantom that too many people chase. Personal peace is found in an intimate relationship with God. This is great gain. When we come to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit works contentment into our hearts. As a result, we will begin to recognize our main purpose for living. That is worshiping God and enjoying Him forever. As we transition down to verses 9 through 10, look with me as I read to see if you notice the strong words that Paul uses in verse 9 to warn Timothy about the desires to be rich and the effect it will have. But those who desire to be rich fall, in temptation, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Notice in verse 9 how it progresses from just the lure of temptation, then to this trap, and then finally to destruction. This process of decline is, is aimed at the person whose only passion is for wealth. It is their only desire in life. 
Also recognize what Paul is not saying here. He's not condemning those who are rich. He, he's warning against the desires to be rich and the destruction that it will bring. We must be on guard against the lure of temptation from our flesh as well as the enticing of Satan through worldly means. The enticing of Satan started in the garden with a piece of fruit and then it led further away from godliness and ultimately to destruction. This warning is not just for the rich, it's for the poor as well. It's about the desires to be rich. And when seeking wealth, we pursue something, we pursue something that cannot find or guarantee any type of satisfaction. It won't guarantee or won't provide satisfaction. Sure, there may be something exciting about the initial, the initial quest, if you will, to gain riches, a season of fun and excitement where you can now buy nicer items and take more adventures and take more trips. But John Stott said it best, gold is like seawater. The more one drinks of it, the thirstier one becomes. We will lie to ourselves who have not experienced this on some level already. But what happens when the excitement runs dry? What happens when the adventures don't satisfy anymore? We must keep up the same pursuit, right? We must keep on doing the same things over and over to try to gain that initial excitement back. Will that pursuit satisfy your heart's desire? From the worldly perspective, it will. But from the biblical perspective, it will be wise for us to listen to Solomon's advice that says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust in your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. The love of money and the desires for wealth are, are not godly. And to reinforce his point, Paul adds a warning, and another strong point, if you will, in verse 10. The covetousness of money is the root of all kinds of evils and sinful lifestyles. Now, Paul doesn't list the type of evils and sinful lifestyles that are a result of, of seeking and, and living for money, but I'm sure you can imagine uh, the choices people will make to earn a dollar or to get rich. Notice that Paul lists two results of body and allure of financial gain. He says, first, some have wandered away from the faith, and two, some have pierced themselves with many pangs. By giving in temptation that money can satisfy the soul, some of uh, Timothy's friends and Paul's friends have wandered away from the faith to pursue worldly idols. This is dangerous, and it's the result of chasing a phantom of wealth because this phantom and this desire will ultimately lead to destruction. Why is being led, why is being led away from Scripture a destructive concern? Because Scripture has the power to produce life when it is guarded protectively when it is guarded and protected correctly. Leaving the faith may not have happened all at once. Based on the progression of temptation in verse 9, they were likely put into situations where they had to choose between honoring God or making a sinful decision. Additionally, I think the NIV captures the last word of verse 10 the best. It says, And pierced themselves with many griefs. The ESV uses pangs, but griefs paints a better picture of the situation that those will find themselves in as they seek the desires of wealth. When you define the original word, it says extreme distress and all-consuming pain that takes over the body and mind. It's almost like a self-sabotage as we seek this lure of temptation. Church, it's a, it's a slippery slope once we give in to one sinful temptation that distracts us from our relationship with Christ. Once you make that one sinful decision, more bait 
will be dropped and we will begin to desensitize ourselves to the truth and exchange it for a lie. As I get closer to retiring from the Marine Corps, one of the things that I have been tempted with is how much money I can squeeze out of the DOD in medical retirement. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I definitely believe people leaving the military, retiring from the, from the military, deserve medical compensation for their sacrifice. This is a good thing that they have uh, sacrificed for, and ultimately it's a blessing that God has provided. But, but many people leaving the military are tempted to have these new medical symptoms and these new medical things that weren't there before. Just like me, they see the lure of more money they can have later in life. They see the temptation. How should the Christian military member respond? How would you respond? Maybe you've been in a similar situation and had a similar temptation. Or maybe now you're hooked by this lure of money and the lure of, of wealth. Maybe you feel trapped and you don't see a way out of this lifestyle that is really a never-ending meaningless satisfaction. You don't see a way of escape. Don't miss who God is in this moment. Don't miss the grace and mercy of God. He still offers true riches in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we find our contentment in Christ. Call out to him. As we transition down to verses 17 through 19, Paul felt it was essential to address the wealthy before concluding his letter. Maybe some Christians acquired wealth before coming to faith in Christ, or maybe after their faith in Christ, God blessed them. Whatever the case was, Paul felt it was essential to provide some, provide some godly principles on how to use their money and their wealth for the glory of God. But before discussing these verses, let me ask us a question to put us all on a level playing field. How would you define the wealthiest person in this room or in the world? Is it their bank accounts? Is it their investments? Is it their savings account? We could define it by asking another question. Do I have more money than my neighbor? The answer to this question puts the rich and the poor on a level playing field. How so? Because no matter, no matter how wealthy you think you are, somebody always has more. No matter, no matter how poor you think you are, somebody always, has, somebody always has less. So now that we're on the same field of wealth, let's see how we can glorify God with the wealth he has blessed us with. Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be, ready, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The first thing that, that Paul says to the rich is not to be haughty with their money or their wealth. To put it another way, don't, don't be puffed up or conceited about, about your fortune. This type of attitude tells what's going on in the hearts of the rich. It is self-pride. Those with these characteristics are, are telling others, and most importantly, telling God that their wealth is a result of all their hard works. Sure, they may have um, gained and worked, or they may have worked hard uh, for that, but there's definitely no dependence upon God and no acknowledgement of who He is. Instead, it's acknowledgement upon themselves. Secondly, Paul says to not set your hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. We don't know what tomorrow has in store for us. 
It may be another economic crash or maybe there's a significant expense that's going to occur in our, in our life. But the point that Paul is trying to make is that the stockpile of cash that we have set aside is, is not guaranteed for tomorrow. But the one who provided you with it is. Thirdly, Paul says they are to do good, to be rich in good works. Accumulating wealth and, and being rich can drive some people to stop working and, and helping others. Think about the parable that Jesus mentioned about the, about the guy who stocked up his barns and quit working. The result of his wealth ended up in laziness. So Paul's warning here is not to be lazy, to keep being a good citizen, to keep working hard and helping others in need. Next, Paul encourages the wealthy to share their riches. Who are we called to share our riches with? Well, it starts with the church. It starts with those inside the church. If the church cannot help each other out through challenging times, and we as a church have missed the love that is found inside the gospel. Then it moves outward to the world, to the lost. Think of the partnership and the work we've been doing with, with Grace Water. The Grace Water team has been financially blessed by the Lord, and they use their finances to gain access into a country and to provide them with a basic necessity of life, water. And in exchange, they are able to share the gospel with them. Let me share this story with you as, as kind of an illustration to these, to these final verses as we come to a close. David Green, the owner of Hobby Lobby, wrote a book called Giving It All Away and Getting It All Back Again. One of the things he talks about in this book that has helped shape his faith and Manage how he, or help, now he managed how he's called to, uh, or believes how he's called to manage Hobby Lobby is the example his parents set for him. His dad was a, a pastor and his mother was a generous soul. Together, they cared for a family of eight, typically in a two bedroom house with no car, and they heavily relied upon the church to provide weekly offerings of food to supplement their income. He writes, As surprising as it may sound, my parents were some of the most generous people I have ever known. This may not seem to fit the picture I painted of their spare living and meager income, but it was true. I had seen evidence of my parents' generosity through the years in a thousand different ways. Mother might only have three or four dresses in her closet, but if she heard of a woman needing one, you could bet mother would soon arrive at the woman's doorstep with a dress in hand. Such acts were repeated time and time again. Yet the most stunning evidence I ever saw of my parents' generosity came in the late 1960s. My younger brother James offered to help my father put his financial books in order. Working through, the, working through his records for many years, James concluded that most that the most my parents or my father ever made in one week was a paltry $138. We weren't surprised when we heard this. We always knew our parents received little money for their labors. What astonished us, though, were the many canceled checks to churches for as much as $100. We soon realized that our parents often gave almost their entire weekly salary back to the churches they served. What amazing generosity. What big souls. As I think about Green's family, they model the principles that Paul is urging Timothy and the church of Ephesus to do. They took caution and they listened to the warnings on the desire to be rich and the dangers that could result. They knew that the gospel brought life and understood what it meant to store treasures for themselves as a good foundation. Because of this, they held on to the gospel and guarded it tightly because they knew it was, it was the most precious thing in life. Green goes on to tell of his mother on her deathbed. My sister was with my mother 
when she passed away. At the time of mother's passing, she sat up with vigor in her voice as she cried out, Do you see them? Do you see them? At first, my sister was puzzled, but she realized that a company of angels had come to take my mother home. I believe that any billionaire would trade places with my mother to experience that joy. Green's mother knew what it meant to see her life through the lens of eternity. She understood the dangers of giving into worldly desires and living for the desires of the flesh. She made it her mission to pursue godliness and store up treasures in heaven. This was a byproduct of the grace of God in her life. By, by grabbing hold of this truth and being cautious of false teachers, she understood that true godliness did not crave wealth. Instead, she found contentment in Christ and share what God gave her. Will you pray with me? Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word produces life. As we are called to guard your word in our lives, I pray that your spirit would urge us on in that process. Help us to trust in you. Help us to trust in what is found in your word. Help us to guard the deposit of the gospel with a pure heart, sincere faith, and a good conscience. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this day. In Christ's name.